Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today, we're going to talk about a sad event that happened in Indianapolis. Indianapolis is a city that mixes old traditions with modern life. It has art museums, festivals, and events like the famous Indy 500 race. But in this story, Indianapolis becomes the setting for a tragic event for the Blackburn family. On November 10th, 2015, something terrible happened. Davy Blackburn had just come back from the gym and parked his car outside his home on Sunnyfield Court. As he was about to get out of the car, he got a phone call that made him stay inside a bit longer. After the call, he finally got out and went into the house. But when he opened the door, he was shocked. His wife was lying on the living room floor, covered in blood. Davy was confused and scared. He quickly checked for signs of life and called for help. In the living room where the tragic event happened, everything was in chaos. Things were scattered around, and the unfortunate woman's purse was emptied. Upstairs, on the second floor of the house, a small child was crying. Emergency services arrived at the house about eight minutes later. The area was blocked off, and the house was filled with police officers and investigators. The victim, 28-year-old Amanda Blackburn, was quickly taken to the hospital. Now, let's go back to the beginning of this sad story, so we don't miss any important details. Amanda Grace Boers was born on July 31 st. 1987, in Muskegon, Michigan. She went to school in Indianapolis, Indiana, but her family moved to Elkhart in 1995. Amanda graduated from Elkhart Christian Academy in 2006 and earned her associate's degree from Pensacola Christian College in Pensacola, Florida, in 2008. Growing up, Amanda was part of a deeply religious family where Christianity was central. Her father served as the lead pastor at First Baptist Church in Elkhart, Indiana. Amanda embraced the teachings of her faith from a young age and held them dear to her heart. Despite the temptations of teenage life, Amanda remained devoted to her beliefs. While other kids were eager to experience adult freedoms, Amanda found joy in her faith and dreamt of serving Jesus. She made a commitment to remain chaste until marriage, a promise she kept faithfully. However, Amanda's heart truly blossomed when she met Davy Blackburn. Davy, originally from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, shared her Christian values. He studied religion at Southern Wesleyan University and came from a deeply religious family. Their connection was strong, and Amanda found in Davy her true and only love. They shared a bond grounded in their faith and values, and their relationship was pure and respectful. Amanda and Davy met on a blind date at a Hawk Nelson Christian Band concert, which was set up by Amanda's sister and Davy's best friend. Even though they attended different colleges, they spent every vacation together, cherishing their time in pure platonic love. They enjoyed simple pleasures like taking walks, sharing their deepest thoughts, and reading passages from church books. Their bond was strong, and they never grew bored in each other's company. Once, before returning to school, they even had a playful milkshake drinking contest, which Amanda lost. Davy jokingly called her a milk girl, but in that moment, he realized she was the one he wanted to marry. Despite being physically apart during their college years, they stayed connected through constant messaging, phone calls, and long conversations. Their relationship was serious and respectful, so much so that they sought guidance from a psychologist to learn how to communicate effectively. On August 1 st. 2008, they got married. Davy believed that their union was part of God's plan and that they shared a special bond from the moment they kissed. For the first four years of their marriage, they lived in South Carolina, where Davy worked as an associate pastor at New Spring Church. However, Davy felt a calling to start a new church for youth in Indianapolis. Although Amanda was hesitant to leave her family and friends behind, they eventually moved to Indianapolis together, where Davy took on various roles in the church, while Amanda struggled with leaving South Carolina. After much hesitation, Amanda finally agreed to move to Indianapolis with her husband, Davy, in 2012. Davy believed that God had significant plans for them. 
They moved from South Carolina to Indianapolis to establish a prominent independent church on the north side. Their church focused on reaching young people, as evidenced by the weekly videos they posted on their website. These videos covered topics like relationship advice, conflict resolution, and teachings from the Bible on intimate relationships. In 2014, they welcomed their first child, Weston Blackburn, and the family was content. They lived in a comfortable home on a quiet street, and their church attracted a large number of young attendees who believed in their sermons. Everything seemed harmonious and peaceful. However, everything changed on November 10 th, 2015. Ambulance crews arrived at the Blackburn residence on Sunnyfield Court around 8, 0 a.m. Amanda, who was pregnant, was rushed to the hospital. Despite efforts to save her and her unborn baby, Amanda passed away the next day. The family had been expecting a baby girl, whom they named E.V. Grace. Amanda's death sparked an outpouring of sympathy and prayers on social media as friends, family, and even strangers mourned her loss. On November 11 th, the day Amanda was officially declared dead, Davy released a statement expressing how Amanda dedicated her life to loving and serving others. He believed that through her legacy, more people would come to find faith in Christ. Davy Blackburn expressed his unwavering belief that Amanda would want him to continue their work in Indianapolis. He remained steadfast in his faith, believing that God would turn their tragedy into triumph and that better days were ahead. The murder of Amanda, a pregnant woman, not only devastated her family but also shocked the entire state. People demanded justice for Amanda and her unborn child, urging authorities to find and punish the perpetrator. In his initial interview, Davy recounted finding Amanda unconscious and injured on the living room floor, partially naked and surrounded by blood. He had left the house around 6, 0 a.m. to go to the gym, leaving the door unlocked as he typically did. Davy expressed regret over not locking the door, acknowledging that it might have prevented the attackers from entering and given Amanda time to seek help. Amanda suffered three gunshot wounds, including one to the head, but no arrests were made in the case. Despite initial suspicions, police quickly ruled out Davy as a suspect. During the trial, Davy's testimony was supported by the account of the first emergency medical paramedic on the scene, Scott Floyd. Scott described Davy as calm and confused, unable to comprehend what had happened to Amanda. Davy maintained that he found her lying on the floor and couldn't wake her up. He claimed to have returned from the gym around 7, 30 a.m. and was on a phone call in the driveway when he made the grim discovery. Davy recounted that he had been checking on their baby, Weston, through the front door window to see if he was awake. He finished his phone call and entered the house at 8, 10 a.m., only to find Amanda lying face down on the floor. Initially, he thought she might be sick or unconscious. It took him until 8, 22 a.m., to call emergency services, a delay of 12 minutes. Despite the gravity of the situation, Davy believed that Amanda might have had a medical emergency related to her pregnancy. He didn't immediately realize the severity of her condition. It wasn't until later that he noticed the extent of her injuries, including brain matter nearby. Emergency room Dr. Scott Floyd testified that the blood on Amanda's head had started to coagulate, indicating that her injuries had occurred a couple of hours earlier. However, the details of these transcripts were not made public. Davy admitted to calling his father after contacting 911, but defense attorneys did not question him further. Authorities found no evidence to contradict Davy's account of the events. Surveillance footage from the gym cleared Davy Blackburn as a suspect in the investigation. An autopsy conducted on November 12 th revealed that Amanda had suffered multiple gunshot wounds, including one to the back of her head, one to her lower left arm that penetrated her biceps, and another that passed through her upper back. Additionally, she had scratches on her left cheek, a split lip, and a knocked-out tooth, suggesting a struggle with her attacker. Law enforcement launched a thorough investigation, examining CCTV footage from nearby streets and interviewing neighbors and acquaintances. One neighbor reported hearing gunshots approximately 35 minutes after Davy had left the house. 
Another neighbor, Reginald Townsell, expressed shock, as the Blackburns were known as wonderful and loving people in the neighborhood. Based on Amanda's injuries and the missing bank cards and MacBook bag, the initial theory was robbery. Further investigation revealed that several emergency calls reporting home invasions had been made in the area on the morning of November 10th, 2015. One woman woke up to find her belongings missing, including her cell phone, laptop, purse, keys, and car. Another reported a burglary at a home on Sunnyfield Court, where someone had broken through the patio screen. According to the police, several items were reported missing from the Blackburn home, including four televisions, a MacBook Pro, a Tiffany Pearl necklace, a pink women's sweater, a remote control, a bag of oranges, and bedding. Five minutes after the initial emergency calls, another call was made to emergency services from Sunnyfield Court, and it was made by Davy Blackburn himself. Lieutenant Richard Rare of the Indianapolis Police Department stated that they were investigating possible connections between the homicide and other burglaries in the neighborhood that occurred that morning. However, the police have not provided specific details about the ongoing investigation, as they are maintaining secrecy to protect the integrity of the case. After obtaining images of possible suspects from one of the burglarized homes, the police released them to the public, seeking assistance in identifying and aiding the investigation. Despite the challenging circumstances, Davy Blackburn expressed confidence in the police department's efforts to apprehend his wife's perpetrator. Investigators affirmed that they were receiving unprecedented support to continue their investigation. Authorities expressed confidence that with the promising leads they had, they would soon apprehend the individuals responsible for the crime. The key clues that helped track down the suspects included a stolen pink sweater, cell phone records, and an ATM receipt. These clues led investigators to a stolen Chrysler Sebring, which was linked to the robberies and found near the Blackburn's home on November 11 th. The ATM receipt matched Amanda Blackburn's stolen card, and surveillance footage from the ATM showed the driver covering their face with a stolen pink sweater. DNA testing from the sweater confirmed the involvement of Jane Watson, marking a significant breakthrough in the case. Cell phone records further implicated Watson and Diana Gordon, showing their phones in the area at the time of the crime. With evidence from DNA testing, surveillance footage, and witness testimonies, authorities were able to identify the suspects and build a case against them. The investigation relied on a combination of forensic analysis and technological evidence to piece together the events leading up to the crime. Phone records also showed that Gordon and Watson were near the Chase Bank where Amanda's debit card was used on the day of the murder. Larry Taylor emerged as the final piece of the puzzle. Surveillance footage in the area helped identify Taylor's phone number and trace his address. In the following days, reports surfaced that a gun had been found near the Blackburn home. A man delivered the gun to the Broad Ripple Fire Department, claiming to have found it outside the couple's residence. Crime lab technicians analyzed the gun, and after two weeks of investigation, police charged 18-year-old Larry Taylor and 21-year-old Jayan Watson with Amanda Blackburn's murder. Additionally, 24-year-old Diana Gordon was arrested for a parole violation but was not charged with a felony as she did not enter the Blackburn home. Crime lab results confirmed that the gun found near the victim's home was the murder weapon. During questioning, Larry Taylor admitted to shooting Amanda twice, claiming self-defense when she allegedly attacked him. The criminal trio had intended to rob the Blackburn house for money. Taylor hit Amanda with a gun to incapacitate her, while Watson and Gordon hesitated and wanted to leave as they already had the bank cards. After stealing Amanda's belongings, the perpetrators sought to withdraw cash from an ATM. Their first attempt to withdraw $500 was unsuccessful, but they managed to withdraw $1,400 from another ATM. Surveillance footage captured their activities at the ATM, which later became crucial evidence. Upon returning to the Blackburn house, they encountered Taylor, who had been left behind. In their absence, Amanda regained consciousness and bravely confronted the intruder, leading to a struggle. Taylor, fearing retaliation, subdued Amanda by tackling her. Subsequently, Taylor placed the stolen debit cards in the car of an accomplice who had gone to the ATM during the crime. 
Upon their return, Larry Taylor admitted to shooting Amanda, as stated in court documents. The Blackburn home was the third target of the attack by Taylor, Watson, and Gordon on November 10 th. In the first break-in, they stole items such as a laptop, wallet, and car while the resident was asleep. Upon realizing they were being recorded by a video camera, they moved on to another home, where they stole various items including televisions, jewelry, and a pink sweater, which later helped identify them to the police. Police collected substantial evidence against the suspects, including Watson's DNA found on the pink sweater used to cover his face during the attempted withdrawal of cash using Amanda Blackburn's bank card. Watson and Gordon cooperated with the investigation in exchange for a reduced sentence. Larry Taylor waived his right to remain silent and confessed to being near the scene of the burglary. Larry Taylor faced 13 charges, including felony charges for the willful killing of Amanda Blackburn. Jalen Watson also faced felony charges, along with multiple counts of burglary, robbery, and theft. Diana Gordon, although in custody due to a parole violation, faced burglary charges as well. The investigation revealed a fourth individual who had knowledge of the crimes but did not actively participate. This person was questioned and released. The Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department, along with the Violent Crimes Unit and Federal Marshals, worked together to apprehend Taylor. During Taylor's first trial in December 2021, it was discovered that a juror had shared information about the case with others, leading to a mistrial being declared. The final trial took place in October 2022. Following the mistrial, Subsequent jury selection was more thorough. Over 100 potential jurors were screened, each filling out a detailed questionnaire to ensure a fair trial. Larry Joe Taylor was ultimately sentenced to 86 years in the Indiana State Correctional Institution for Amanda Blackburn's murder and related burglary charges. Deano Gordon and Jalen Watson cooperated with authorities, agreeing to plea agreements and testifying against Larry Taylor. They received sentences ranging from 20 to 35 years in prison. Both Taylor and Watson are currently serving their sentences in Marion County Jail. In Indiana, a murder conviction can result in 45 to 60 years in prison, with some cases carrying life imprisonment or the death penalty. Prosecutors sought to enhance Taylor's sentence due to Amanda's pregnancy at the time of her murder, potentially adding another 20 years to his term. Davy Blackburn, the church's pastor, expressed relief that those responsible for his wife's death had been apprehended, ensuring they couldn't harm anyone else. Amanda Blackburn's tragic death touched thousands of individuals, including high-ranking officials like the state's chief executive. Her funeral, held at a Christian church, drew over 2,000 attendees, including Governor Mike Pence. To assist with the financial burden of funeral and medical expenses, the church established a donation page. Despite the immense pain his family has endured, Davy Blackburn remains hopeful for justice through the judicial system. He has consistently emphasized the importance of accountability for those responsible for the loss his family has suffered. Davy Blackburn's response to Amanda's killers was one of forgiveness. Despite the natural inclination to feel anger and despair, he chose the path of forgiveness, grace, and hope. Speaking to reporters, he expressed relief at the arrest, emphasizing his decision to forgive. This remarkable act of forgiveness garnered attention nationwide, with media coverage extending to both national and international platforms. In the aftermath of the tragedy, Davy transitioned from being a grieving husband to a prominent blogger. Through his blog and various media appearances, including podcasts and videos titled Nothing Wasted, he shared his experiences and insights. Despite the pain of his loss, he appeared resilient and determined. It's difficult to draw definitive conclusions about Davy Blackburn's actions and motives based solely on the information provided. While the timing of the insurance payout and the purchase of a new home may raise questions, it's essential to consider various factors before making judgments. It's worth noting that individuals respond to grief and trauma differently, and some may cope by making significant life changes or investments. 
Davy's decision to purchase a new home and move forward with his life does not necessarily indicate malicious intent or wrongdoing. People often seek stability and a fresh start after experiencing loss. Additionally, the portrayal of Davy's happiness in his new marriage and home may be part of his coping mechanism or an attempt to find solace and joy amidst tragedy. It's essential to approach the situation with empathy and understanding, acknowledging that everyone navigates grief in their own way. Ultimately, without further information or evidence, it's challenging to make definitive statements about Davy Blackburn's actions and emotional state. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe for more. Stay safe and alert.